<laughs> yeah, me, me. Good afternoon, attendees. Welcome to Osprosis and Fall Prevention Festival organized by SATA Comp Health. My name is Huda and I'm your MC for today. Let's welcome our renowned speaker, Nadira Binderoslan. She's a senior physiotherapist in Kutipat Hospital. Nadira graduated from Singapore Institute of Technology with a bachelor degree in physiotherapy. She's currently working in the acute setting in rehabilitation center. Her area of interest is in active aging aims to improve and encourage our silver population to lead a more active lifestyle. Today, she'll be talking about fall prevention in adults. Please take note that you're only able to ask questions during the Q&A session at the end of the talk, either through the Q&A box, chat box, or raise your, raise your hand and we will unmute you. Now, I will pass the time to Ms. Nadira. Hi everyone, my name is Nadira and I'm a senior physiotherapist from Kutepat Hospital. So I have been working closely with the older population, mainly in the acute setting, but I do have some experience with the community setting as well. So today my talk will be mainly on false prevention. Hold on.
Okay. Today, my talk will be mainly on false prevention in the older adults. So my content will be firstly to understand false, go through some of the false risk screening tools, false risk factors, understanding osteoporosis as a false risk factor. I will be sharing some false prevention tips as well as uh, tips on how to increase physical activity. And lastly, uh, to share some community resources to increase your physical activity. So firstly, do you know that falls are not a natural part of aging? While many factors increase the risk of falling as we age, falling is not a normal part of aging and most falls can actually be prevented. So what is a fall? A fall is defined as an unexpected event in which the participant comes to rest on the ground, floor or lower level without known loss of consciousness. A near fall is an event when the individual sleeps, trips or loses balance, but uses the hands or legs or any body part to recover balance and prevent a complete fall. So how common is falls in Singapore? It was found that one in three community dwelling elderly age more than 65 years of age and one in two of those age more than 80 fall down each year. Many of these elderly are silent fallers, meaning they do not report the fall to their loved ones or even seek medical attention unless they are injured. It was found that falls account for 85% of all cases of elderly patients with trauma that were seen at the emergency department. What are the possible consequences of a fall? A fall can result in physical, psychological, as well as social consequences. Falls can lead to physical injuries, cause pain, or even fractures. This could result in reduced independence, whereby our elderly may require increased assistance in walking and activities of daily living, such as showering. With that, some may even have reduced activity levels, as they may not be able to do things that they used to do before, such as walking lesser, not able to do chores. And also, with pain and discomfort following a fall, this can cause a change in walking pattern, as some of them may be limping when they walk. Falls can also result in psychological issues. When someone loses their independence, especially in daily tasks such as wearing pants, this could lead to frustration. Imagine not being able to wear pants on your own and requiring someone to assist you all the time. Naturally, you will feel frustrated too, right? After a fall, the individual may lose their confidence and could develop fear of falling, feel distress and anxious, and may restrict their activities, such as not wanting to go out anymore, resulting in social isolation that may even cause them to be depressed. Some of our elderly also do not like the idea of having to use walking aids as they feel embarrassed being seen by their friends, or they do not want to face the fact that actually they need one. Also, when an individual is unable to fully take care of himself, he may lose his self-esteem as well. Lastly, when one has lost his independence, as mentioned earlier, he may not want to go out anymore. This will result in reduced community participation, such as going to the coffee shop to meet friends or going to places of worship. A fall will also result in changes in their daily routine, whereby modifications would need to be made, such as showering in sitting instead of standing or getting assistance from someone. This could re result in reduced quality of life for the, the individuals. It is important to know that a fall that is not addressed may lead to recurrent falls. It was found that 30% of fallers will fall again. Recurrent falls are defined as more than two falls in a year and are rarely att attributable to mechanical cause or rather accidental cause. This means that the elderly usually fall due to a medical problem or risk factors that are modifiable. The study that was done by Professor Sherrington, who is well versed in falls, found out that the bulk of falls happen due to tripping. Thus, this goes to show that a large number of falls can actually be prevented by modifying certain things, which I will be going through further later. Now, are you at risk of falls? So how do we know? There are simple falls risk screening tools available that are used to check if an elderly is at risk of falls. An example would be one from STEADY, which stands for Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths and Injuries in the US. These are two simple screening tools to check if you are at risk of falling. 
The first one consists of three questions whereby a yes to any of the questions indicates a risk of falling. So the question includes, do you feel unsteady when you're standing or walking? Are you worried about falling? Have you fallen in the past year? The second one is called stay independent, which is stay independent, which consists of 12 questions, which I will go through later. So this is stay independent that consists of 12 questions to check your risk of falling. You can have a look and count the number of yeses you have as one point. If you score more than or equal to four, it means that you are at risk of falling. However, if your score is less than four, it is important to check if you have fallen in the past year. If the answer is yes, then you are at risk of falling. What are some of the false risk factors? So mainly there are three domains, environmental, behavioral, and biological. The risk of falling increases proportionally with the number of fall risk factors present in an individual. Environmental factors such as home hazards, like poor lighting, cluttered living space with minimal space to move around, slippery or uneven floor, tripping hazards such as loose rugs or multiple wirings on the floor, and improper footwear can cause falls. All these factors are actually modifiable and changes to these can help to prevent falls. Behavioral factors include actions, emotions, or choices of the individual. History of previous falls is one of the best predictors of a future fall. Any previous fall increases the risk of another fall threefold. A previous fall may reduce the mobility in older people, resulting in loss of strength and balance. Feelings of fear and helplessness can occur, which could lead them to restrict the activity and participation, which could also result in reduced physical function and progressive weakness, which could therefore re uh, increase their fall risk. Reduced safety awareness, which may include risk-taking behavior, may be due to underlying cognitive impairment or sometimes by choice. Examples could be not using their prescribed walking aids or climbing onto a flimsy plastic stool to reach for things placed too high up. Poor nutrition can lead to reduced energy, which affects the ability to safely perform daily activities. Poor hydration leads to dizziness, dehydration, and low blood volume, which can also increase the risk of falling. Lack of physical activity or increased sedentary behavior can result in reduced muscle mass, decreased bone density, and poor balance, which increases falls risk. Taking multiple medications, especially psychoactive medications or antidepressants, can, also, can cause sedation, and sometimes side effects can occur that can further impair balance and walking, thus increasing the falls risk. Biological risk factors include those pertaining to the human body and are related to the natural aging process as well as the effects of health conditions. Some conditions cannot be changed, such as age, while others may be prevented or compensated for, such as muscle weakness or poor vision. Age-related changes in the neural, sensory, and musculoskeletal systems can lead to muscle weakness and poor balance control, resulting in walking instability and thus increase the chances of falling. Certain medical conditions that affect vision, muscles, muscle strength or posture, for example, Parkinson's disease, cataracts, stroke, or osteoporosis can also increase your risk of falling. Osteoporosis is a medical condition that can cause higher risk of physical injuries in the event of a fall, such as fractures. So I will further expand later on. So what to do if you are found to be at risk of falling? It is very important to update and consult your doctor or a healthcare professional. They will then assess your false risk factors thoroughly and intervene the identified risk factors. So do not delay and go get it checked. So what is osteoporosis and why is it important to understand its impact, especially on falls? Osteoporosis is a disease that is characterized by low bone mass, deterioration of bone tissue, and disruption of bone microarchitecture. This can lead to compromised bone strength and an increase in the risk of fractures. It is usually described as a silent disease because there are often no symptoms, you cannot feel your bones weakening, and it is usually only found out after an elderly has a fall that causes a fracture. 
Osteoporosis is the world's most common bone disease, affecting approximately 200 million people globally. It results in more than 8.9 million fragility fractures each year, with about one in three women and one in five men over the age of 50 experiencing a fragility fracture in their lifetime. In individuals over 50 years old, the risk of osteoporotic fractures are 40% for women and 13% for men. Osteoporosis occurs more in women because women tend to have smaller, thinner bones than men. Also, menopause causes the body to produce significantly less hormone estrogen, which helps to maintain bone and protect bone density, hence leading to a rapid decrease in bone health. Falls are the cause of majority of osteoporotic fractures. So common fracture type includes the spine, hip, distal forearm, and proximal humerus or shoulder. With osteoporosis, your falls risk also increases, which will be discussed later. However, another important thing to note when you have osteoporosis is that fragility fractures can occur. Fragility fractures are fractures that result from mechanical forces that would not ordinarily result in fracture known as low-level or low-energy trauma. The WH, the World Health Organization has quantified this as forces equivalent to a fall from a standing height or less. This means that individuals with osteo osteoporosis have increased risk of fractures even with a mild fall or bump that normally do not cause a fracture. Therefore, it is very important to prevent falls. So how does osteoporosis increase the risk of fall potentially? As osteoporosis results in loss of bone mass, the vertebral bones in the spine weakens and are susceptible to fracture that typically occurs in a wedge shape with the front vertebra collapsing and losing its height while the back vertebra maintains the height. As the front part of the bone is crushed, that segment of the spine tips forward resulting in an excessive kyphotic curve and forward stoop posture. With kyphosis, this causes a change in postural alignment and shifts the center of gravity more forwards and downwards, hence resulting in poorer balance control, thus increasing the risk of falls. Now that we know what causes falls, what can we do to prevent falls? Here are some of the false prevention tips, mainly to speak up to your medical provider, going for regular medical checkups, keeping your bones strong, making your home safer, ensuring you're wearing proper footwear, as well as staying active and increasing your physical activity. So firstly, talk openly with your doctor about fall risk and prevention, especially if you had a fall or worry about falling or you feel unsteady. Ensure you go for regular eye checks, get your doctors to review the medications that you take as some medicines or combinations of certain medicines can make you sleepy, dizzy or even cause you to fall. Secondly, keeping your bones strong by ensuring you are consuming the essential nutrients such as calcium and vitamin D. Adults aged 51 and above require at least 1,000 mg calcium per day. Based on an average Singapore diet, you are already having about 700 mg calcium per day. Hence, to have enough calcium, you need to add one more calcium-rich food to your daily diet as seen in the picture here. Vitamin D helps the body absorb calcium, which is essential in forming and maintaining strong bones and teeth. Together with calcium, vitamin D also helps protect older adults from osteoporosis. The best way to obtain sufficient vitamin D is to take a walk outdoors when the sun is up. 15 to 30 minutes of exposure to sunlight every day is sufficient. However, uh, Avoid outdoor activities during the hottest period of the day, which is about 10.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Otherwise, vitamin D can also be found in food sources such as eggs, salmon, sardine, milk, and cod liver oil.
So the next tip will be to make your home safer. How can you make your home safer? Remember at the start, at the start it was shown that the biggest cause of falls was stripping. You can make your home safer by using non-slip mats to replace loose rugs. Avoid wet floors, ensure to clean up mess or spills immediately so that nobody will slip and fall. Avoid placing items that are required daily, such as plates at hard to reach areas and keep frequently used items where it is usually easily accessible. Next, to ensure that wires are tucked nicely and neatly, Ensure that there is sufficient lighting throughout the house, especially at night where you can consider a night light or keeping a switch on throughout. Bread bars can also be installed, especially in the toilet to offer additional support when our elderly wants to sit or stand from the toilet bowl. Ensure that your home environment is kept neat without any items laying around that may potentially cause you to trip, slip and fall. Furniture can also be arranged to make clear pathways for, for walking. Another tip to minimize your fall risk include ensuring you are wearing proper footwear. So wear, wear well-fitting non-slip shoes when you go out, even if it's just a short distance walk to the market or downstairs. So the last and most important tip will be to stay active and increase physical activity. Physical activity has lots of benefits for older adults as seen here, and it can actually reduce the chances of falls by 30%. So what is physical activity? It is defined as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that requires energy expenditure. It refers to all movement, including during leisure time, for transport to get to and from places, or as part of a person's work. Here are some of the recommendations for physical activity from the World Health Organization as well as Health Promotion Board. So what kind of exercise to do? Older adults should do at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity, or at least 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity, or an equivalent combination of moderate and vigorous intensity activity throughout the week for substantial health benefits. This could include Aerobics exercise like walking, cycling, swimming, and cross trainer. Intensity is determined by your level of effort. Moderate intensity activity requires a medium level of effort on a scale of 0 to 10, where sitting is 0 and the greatest effort possible is 10. Moderate intensity activity is about 5 or 6 and produces noticeable increases in breathing and as well as heart rate. On the other hand, vigorous intensity activity begins at a level of 7 or 8 on this same scale and produces large increases in a person's breathing as well as heart rate. So a general rule of thumb is that 2 minutes of moderate intensity activity counts the same as 1 minute of vigorous intensity activity. For example, 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity is roughly the same as 15 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. Older adults should also do muscle strengthening activities at moderate or greater intensity that involve all major muscle groups on two or more days a week. These exercises should consist of 8 to 12 repetitions per exercise, or you should continue to do until it will be difficult to do another repetition without help. 
Strengthening exercises include bodyweight exercise such as sit to stand, hip side raises and calf raises as seen in the pictures here. If you are a beginner, then you should start off with one set first then slowly progress by increasing the repetitions, number of sets or difficulty of exercises. Another form of strengthening exercises are using equipment such as, as shown in the pictures here, chest press, let's pull down and leg press. So these equipment can be found in rehab centers, gyms, or even fitness corners. Another popular form of strengthening exercises, especially during this period, will be usage of resistance bands. This can be purchased easily at pharmacies or sports shops that, and are very convenient to do the exercises at home. It is also recommended that older adults should do a varied multi-component physical activity that emphasizes functional balance and strength training at moderate or greater intensity on three or more days a week to enhance functional capacity and to prevent falls. So while it is recommended to do two days of strength exercises, you can do another day of balance exercises or mix these exercises for at least three days a week. Balance exercises include Tai Chi, supported single leg stands, tandem balance, where you put one foot ahead of another. Balance exercise needs to be challenging in order for you to improve. However, it is important to ensure that it is done safely, like doing the exercise near the wall and placing a chair in front in case one loses balance and the adult should always be under the supervision of someone. In general, incorporate physical activity in your daily routine, such as taking the stairs rather than the lift, walking to run errands instead of driving, or even alighting one or more MRT bus stops earlier to do some walking. Most importantly, it is recommended to limit the amount of time being sedentary or inactive, such as like watching TV or just sitting around and replace with more physical activity. Doing some physical activity is better than none. If not meeting recommendations, doing some physical activity will bring benefits to health. Start by doing small amounts of physical activity and gradually increase the frequency, intensity, as well as duration. So although older adults should be as physically active as their functional ability allows and adjust the level of effort for activity to their fitness level. Here's a summary of the physical activity recommended for the elderly according to emphasis. So the base of the pyramid is the biggest emphasis that recommends incorporating physical activity every day by being more active, such as doing chores, walking the dog, followed by aerobic exercises, strengthening exercises, and at the very top will be to limit your periods of inactivity, such as watching TV. So now that we know what exercises we can do, can exercise help in osteoporosis? The answer is yes. With regards to osteoporosis, weight-bearing exercises are important as it can help to improve or maintain bone mineral density and decrease the rate of bone loss. Weight-bearing means when your feet and legs support your body's weight, and this could include activities like walking or any other body weight exercises. However, there are special precautions to note with osteoporosis, such as to avoid high impact and explosive movement, avoid twisting movements, and to always start with something gentle first, like a light weight or a short brisk walk. In general, physical activity guidelines for older adults are 
Older people should do some form of physical activity, no matter what their age, weight, health problems, or abilities. Older people should be active every day in as many ways as possible during a range of physical activities that incorporates fitness, strength, balance, and flexibility. Older people should accumulate at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most, preferably all days. Those who have stopped physical activity or who are starting a new physical activity should start at a level that is easily manageable and then gradually build up the recommended amount, type and frequency of activity. Older people who continue to enjoy a lifetime of vigorous physical activity should also carry on doing so in a manner suited to their capability into later life, provided recommended safety procedures and guidelines are adhered to. So what next? Where can you go to exercise? There are many options. You can either do at home or fitness corners are easily available. Senior activity centers, active aging hubs, day rehab centers, other private centers or even gyms. Here are some of the lists of senior activity centers in Singapore with services provided such as recreational activities, befriending programs, social activities, monitoring of seniors, promoting a healthy nutrition exercise, as well as providing basic health prevention programs. There are plenty of, of programs, not only focused on physical activity. There are also active aging hubs and programs available that offers group exercise sessions and other programs which are good for elderly to socialize as well. So as you can see, there are other interesting programs, not only for exercise, for social activities, or even cooking classes. But remember, before you start off your exercise program, especially when you're just starting, please consult your doctor first and fill up the PACQ form. This form will help to guide whether you are ready to start exercising or if you need to check with your doctor for clearance. Okay, so here are some of the exercises that you can do at home. You can have a look. So this is another example of uh, exercise video, good for those who love to groove to the music. So you can have a look.
Okay, now we have come to the end of my talk. I hope you are able to understand false better now. And if you have false risk, please don't forget to update your doctor. Remember, you can reduce your false risk, improve your function and maintain your independence by following the false prevention tips that I have discussed earlier. So doing at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most or all days, such as doing chores as well as aerobic, strengthening, and balance exercises. If you are not meeting the recommendations, doing some physical activity will bring benefits to health. So the next step will be to start exercising from the comfort of your own home or head down to the nearest exercise facility to start. Okay, thank you. If there are any questions, you can go ahead to ask. Uh, almost done.
I think there's a question from me. Fong, one cup soybeans is 180 gram of what nutrient? So this is uh, calcium. The best time under the sun. To from Elena. So the best time under the sun will be uh, in the morning, but avoid ten thirty to three thirty p.m. So from PT, what type of exercises recommended if you have knee pain? So it depends on what activity is actually causing you pain. Is it movement or is it weight bearing that is causing you pain? If it's a new, new kind of pain, then maybe you would want to rest first and avoid further aggravating it. But otherwise, if it's a chronic kind of pain, then you can start doing simple exercises within, within the pain limits. From Wei, Wei Tiong Chia. I noticed most of the exercises you should require balancing, so I guess it helps to avoid falls. Yes, correct. So um, there are different types of exercises. If let's say your the, the elderly balance is not very good, then you can start off simple first. So with uh, hand supported kind of exercises, then you can progress to without using hands. Tai Chi. Tai Chi is actually quite a good exercise as well because it's a uh, multi-component. It's, it's, uh, it works on balance as well as strength as well. Yeah, if you are a beginner, maybe you can start off with um, the, the ones that I've shown, seated exercises first, and then you can progress to standing. What about evening time as morning? I need to go market, Elena. In on your way to the market, you should also be already exposed to sunlight. I mean, as long as you are out and about. So that should be sufficient. Chi Kong, Chi Kong different from Tai Chi. I mean, I'm not really familiar with it, but I guess it's about the it's similar. It it has a lot of balance components as well. Yeah, 
Thank you so much, Ms. Nadira, for your beneficial sharing. Uh, for those who are interested in getting the link for the exercise videos, feel free to drop us an email at mediacontact at sata.com.sg. Um, and also, you can also contact our hotline at 6244-6688. I repeat, 6244-6688. I hope you guys have enjoyed the session and till then, goodbye.